You see, in Psalm 8, 2, the weapons of victory for God come out of the mouth. But you look in Revelation 16, 13 for a moment and see that Satan's weapons also are launched through the mouth. The mouth of those who yield to the spirits of Satan. Revelation 16, verse 13, John says, I saw three unclean spirits like frogs come out of the mouth of the dragon and out of the mouth of the beast and out of the mouth of the false prophet. So whether they be for good or for evil, spiritual weapons are launched through the mouths of human beings. And we have got to be very sure that our mouths are launching pads for God's weapons and not for the devil's. And if we do not use our mouths aright, we cannot win the spiritual victory. It's what comes out of your mouth that is going to settle the conflict for better or for worse all right the third fact about praise as a spiritual weapon is that it is the way into Christ's victory let us look in Psalm 106 verse 47 this is an inspired prayer of the Lord for the regathering of his people and I believe it applies at this time in which we are living to Israel as a nation being regathered in their land and to the church being regathered to form again the body of Jesus Christ bone to bone and member to member there's a regathering in the natural of Israel there's a regathering in the spiritual of the members of Christ's body to restore the unity which has been broken down through the centuries and the purpose of this regathering is stated in Psalm 106 verse 47 Save us, O Lord our God, and gather us from among the heathen to give thanks unto thy holy name and to triumph in thy praise. This brings out the same point that we said earlier. God's intervention is for this purpose that we may in turn glorify him by praising him. So God's intervention on behalf of Israel and behalf of the church is designed to bring forth out of God's people praise and glory to his name save us and gather us for this purpose to give thanks unto thy holy name and to triumph in thy praise when do we triumph when we praise God aright you know what triumph is it's more than victory the victory is the winning of the battle the triumph is the celebration of the victory that has already been won now there's a tremendous truth in scripture about the triumph Let's turn to Colossians chapter 2 and verse 15. Colossians 2 and verse 15. This is speaking about what God did through the death of Jesus Christ on our behalf on the cross. We will not go into the background because if I go into the background I'll never get out into the foreground again but we'll just deal with this one verse. Having spoiled or stripped or completely disarmed principalities and powers that Satan's principalities he made a show of them openly triumphing over them in the cross so in the cross through the death of Jesus on our behalf God stripped Satan and his powers of all their weapons and he put him to an open shame and Jesus triumphed over the devil in the cross now in 2 Corinthians 2.14 this is transferred to our experience in Christ 2 Corinthians 2.14 Paul says now thanks be unto God who always causeth us to triumph in Christ and maketh manifest the savour of his knowledge by us in every place I want you to notice that if you put the adverbial phrases together there are no exceptions it's always in every place there is no time and there is no place where the church of Jesus Christ cannot be victorious God always causes us and in every place he makes manifest the sweet savor of the knowledge of Jesus Christ by us there is no time and no place where this is impossible But the central phrase is, God always causes us to triumph in Christ. 
And I think some of the modern translations use the phrase makes us a continuing pageant of triumph in Christ. This is the possibility made available to us through what Christ did on our behalf on the cross. On the cross, Jesus won the victory. He does not ask us to win the victory. He invites us to share the triumph. Now, by the custom of the Roman Empire, which Paul undoubtedly had in his mind when he wrote these words, the triumph was the highest honor that could be bestowed upon any successful Roman general. If he had been outstandingly successful in the service of his country and in the defeating of his country's enemies, when he came back to the city of Rome, the Senate would vote him a triumph. And the triumph was organized somewhat like this, that this uniquely successful general would be placed in a special chariot drawn by two white horses, and he would be led in the chariot through the streets of Rome. And the people of Rome would line the streets on either side and applaud him and do him homage as he went past. Behind his chariot, there would be laid, as far as possible, the evidences of his victory. If any rulers of foreign nations, kings or queens or other rulers, had been defeated, they would be placed in chains, chained to the rear of the chariot, and led behind. And then there would be a whole line of prisoners of war, rank after rank of prisoners, led in chains, behind this chariot as the evidence of what the man had conquered. And if there were wild beasts from that particular area that the Romans did not habitually see, as for instance a tiger, they would capture a tiger and leave this tiger also captive behind the chariot. In other words, behind the chariot was led as far as possible the visible evidence of the measure of the victory that this man had won in his captives and the kings and rulers and other generals whom he had defeated and anything else that would make vivid the reality of his victory. Now this is the picture that Paul has in mind. He says, through the cross, Jesus has defeated Satan and is now being laid in a pageant of triumph. And behind him are being led all those whom he has defeated with the evidence of their defeat made publicly manifest. Satan and all the forces that opposed God and Christ in this picture are following behind the chariot. They defeat and the fact that they've been stripped of their armor being made publicly manifest. This is the extent of what Paul is teaching was accomplished through the cross. Now there's one further little piece of icing on the cake. God, Paul says God causes us to join the pageant of triumph with Christ. Now where do we come in? Are we led in captivity behind the chariot? I don't believe it. That's the place for the enemy. Are we just on the sides of the road applauding? I don't believe it. Where are we? In the chariot. That's right. Now how do we get to the chariot? I've asked this question many times as a preacher and I used to have this answer by faith but that left many people still wondering what to do and one day God showed me that we triumph in his praise when we start to praise him for what God says he's done on our behalf we step out of the street and into the chariot we take our place with Christ in the chariot the way to get into the chariot is to stop crying, stop praying, stop fretting, stop trying, and start praising. And it's the praise step that takes you off the street and into the chariot. God always causes us to be a continuing pageant of triumph in Christ. And everywhere he makes manifest the sweet savor of Jesus Christ by us we carry the odor and the perfume of Jesus wherever we go. Heaven's atmosphere should be where we go. But it's all conditional upon praise. Praise is the air freshener. 
Praise the Lord. When you feel really down and your home and living room seem so dark and gloomy, just take the air freshener and squirt a little praise into the atmosphere and it will begin to smell sweet. Now let's look at some further facts about praise in closing this study which are necessary to understand in order to be able to do it effectively. The next thing I want to say I've already touched on but I want to say it more specifically is this. Praise is a sacrifice and a sacrifice costs something. Lots and lots of Christians don't praise God because they don't feel like it. Well that's the worst reason for not praising God. The less you feel like it the more you should do it because it is a sacrifice. Let's look at the scriptures teaching on this. Jeremiah 33 and verse 11. And this is one of the chapters that describe the restoration of God's people Israel. The whole of this chapter is devoted to restoration. And notice one of the great aspects of restoration. Incidentally, there's a modern Hebrew song based on Jeremiah 33, 10 and 11. I feel almost inspired to try and sing it, but I'll desist. But the song takes the words of verse 10 and 11 and says, Again there shall be heard in this place and in the streets of Jerusalem the voice of joy, the voice of gladness, the voice of the bride, and the voice of the bridegroom. There's a very popular modern Hebrew song that has those words. Notice what will be heard in verse 11 of Jeremiah 33. The voice of joy and the voice of gladness, the voice of the bridegroom and the voice of the bride, the voice of them that shall say, Praise the Lord of hosts. For the Lord is good, for his mercy endureth forever and of them that shall bring the sacrifice of praise into the house of the Lord. What sacrifice? The sacrifice of praise. And now listen. For I will cause to return the captivity of the land. Why does God return the captivity? That they may bring the sacrifice of praise. The same truth comes out everywhere that this matter of restoration is dealt with. God restores us. He rescues us, he delivers us, that in return we may bring him the sacrifice of praise. Now this sacrifice is spoken of specifically in the New Testament in Hebrews chapter 13. Hebrews the 13th chapter, verses 15 and 16. Hebrews points out that the sacrifices of the law of Moses, the beasts that were offered and so on, were only a temporary ordinance which were to come to an end and be replaced by other permanent sacrifices and here we are told of the permanent sacrifices which are required of us in this dispensation Hebrews 13 verses 15 and 16 by him therefore that is by Jesus Christ let us offer the sacrifice of praise to God continually that is the fruit of our lips giving thanks unto his name but to do good and to communicate that is to share your material possessions forget not for with such sacrifices God is well pleased you notice there are three sacrifices the sacrifice of praise the sacrifice of doing good when it costs you something to do good and the sacrifice of sharing your material possessions that's what the word means each of these is a sacrifice I came into our home last night at about seven o'clock just thinking wonderful a night at home nowhere to go and there was a phone call saying would I go over and help our daughter with the young people's meeting and I tell you that was a real sacrifice but God blessed me for it and anything that really is going to bring a blessing is going to cost you something David said God forbid that I should offer to the Lord burnt offerings and sacrifices that cost me nothing a sacrifice always costs something and here are three sacrifices that God requires. Praise, doing good, and sharing our material well-being. But let's look at the sacrifice of praise, the one we're dealing with. By him, Jesus Christ, this is verse 15, let us offer a sacrifice of praise to God every now and then when I feel like it. No, continually. All right, Lord, I'll praise you in my heart, but I feel embarrassed to praise you out loud. God says the fruit of our lips, not our heart, our lips, giving thanks to God by the name of Jesus. This is a sacrifice that God requires, that we thank him and praise him out loud in the name of Jesus. We all know that's the hard thing to do, is to do it out loud. But that's what makes it valuable. That's the costly aspect of it. 
most of us have had the experience of being in a meeting where everybody put their hands up and started praising the Lord. And you thought, what, what are these people doing? And you know, if you were like me, when this first happened to me, I thought, well, now there must be 15 people behind me and they'll all watch me if I put my hands up. But it's a sacrifice. Let's read on because this is mentioned a little later. When should we praise God? I've just got a few questions here, the outline that we'll answer briefly out of Scripture. When is it right to praise God? I've got two verses out of maybe a hundred that you could pick in the Scripture. Psalm 34, verse 1. I will bless the Lord at all times, and his praise shall continually be in my mouth. Not my heart, but my mouth. There is no time that you shouldn't be blessing and praising God. And Psalm 145 says the same thing again in other words. Psalm 145, verse 2, Every day will I bless thee, and I will praise thy name forever and ever, eternally. Eternity will be too short to praise the Lord. All right, how should we praise the Lord? Let's look at a few scriptures in there. Psalm 111, verse 1, Praise ye the Lord. I will praise the Lord with my whole heart. Not half-hearted praise, but whole-hearted praise. Put your whole being, everything you have, into praising the Lord. Where? In the assembly of the upright and in the congregation of God's people. I will praise God with my whole heart. Psalm 47, verse 7, gives another requirement of acceptable praise. Psalm 47, verse 7. For God is the King of all the earth. Sing ye praises with understanding. God expects us to know why we're praising him. And the reason why we're praising him is because of his unchanging nature, his love, his mercy, his truth, which never changes with situations, feelings, or circumstances, and specifically what God has done for us through Christ on the cross, which never changes. All these reasons the scripture gives us for praising God never change with our feelings, our situation, or our circumstance. And when we understand that, and sing praises with understanding, we do not allow our feelings, our situation, or our circumstance to withhold us from praising God. We don't praise God because of what we see or feel. We praise God because of what He says in His Word. All right. Psalm 63, a further aspect of praise, and a rather important one. Psalm 63, verses 4 and 5. There's a very beautiful chorus being written to these words, but I'm not going to try to sing it. Because thy loving kindness is better than life, my lips shall praise thee. Notice again, it's the lips, not the heart. I don't mean that the praise doesn't come from the heart, but I mean it mustn't stop in the heart. It must come through the lips. Thus will I bless thee while I live. Thus means in this way, and the psalmist then goes on to say, I will lift up my hands, in thy name. This is the appointed way to bless and praise God is with the lifting up of hands. Now, if you want to compare this with the New Testament for a moment, 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 8. 1 Timothy chapter 2 verse 8. Paul says, and he's giving directions for the conduct of a congregation, a local assembly, I will therefore that men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubting. That's the only specific physical attitude of prayer actually enjoined in the New Testament. We have the example of praying standing, we have the example of praying kneeling, but the only one that we're actually enjoined to do is to pray lifting up our hands. And it says men. Well, the ladies say, well, what about us? The next verse says, in like manner also the women. So what's right for the men is equally right for the women. This is the appointed attitude of prayer, praise and worship. It's the lifting up of our hands without wrath and doubting because these two negative things will inhibit our praise. Psalm 141, a most beautiful picture of what praise is. Psalm 141 verse 2 Let my prayer be set forth before thee as incense and the lifting up of my hands as the evening sacrifice. So our prayer goes up in the nostrils of God just like the incense ascended up from the hand of the priest in the Old Covenant. It's a sweet 
odour that ascends up into the presence of God. Let my prayer come before thee as incense, and the lifting up of my hands as the evening sacrifice. Israel had to give a daily sacrifice, one in the morning and one in the evening. And the writer says, Let my evening sacrifice to thee at the close of each day be the lifting up of my hands. And you'll end the day well if you end it that way. You should have a good night's sleep after that. Psalm 149, there's another thing about praising the Lord which few people have yet seen. But the Lord taught me this lesson. Speaking about praise, and these two last psalms are entirely devoted to praise, let them praise his name in the dance. And Psalm 150 verse 4, praise him with the timbrel and dance. One thing you'll observe if you go to Israel is the Jewish people are a dancing people. It's as natural to them to dance as it is to sing or do anything else. You couldn't have the natural, spontaneous expression of the feeling of the Jewish people divorced from dancing. And you read through the Bible and see how much dancing is intended to be an expression of gratitude and praise and worship to God. I'll tell you, we are inhibited until we learn to praise the Lord in the dance. I'm not talking about dancing in the spirit, a phrase which doesn't occur in the Bible, though it may be a valid thing. I'm talking about dancing before the Lord, which is what David did. He didn't say I danced in the spirit, but when his wife criticized him, looking through the window and said, you made a show of yourself today, dancing in front of all those serving maids, David said, I didn't do it in front of the serving maids, I did it before the Lord. And he said, what's more, I'm going to go on doing it. I remember a meeting about three or four years ago when a brother in the Lord came with choruses and cymbals, and he's known to most of us here, but I don't want to mention his name just because I don't believe in bringing personalities in. And I had known what it was to do a little dancing, but I'd always done it with a certain amount of, mind you, in the world, I would go out five nights a week dancing, and if I didn't come back till dawn, that didn't embarrass me. If I could only be as wholehearted serving the Lord as I was serving the devil, I'd be doing well. Anyhow, there came a time when people started to dance in this meeting and I thought I'm going to dance. And I started to dance and I realized people were looking at me. I was pretty well known in that congregation. And I thought I could care less. And after a while I was getting so hot I took my jacket off and I went on dancing. And I danced so long that somebody had time to go and fetch a camera and come back and photograph me. I still could care less. Well, you say, what did that do? I'll tell you what it did. It set me free from the fear of man. I could care less what people think if I'm doing what God wants. But I had to do that to be finally set free from that fear of embarrassment and what people might say or think. Now, it doesn't mean that God's got to do that for everybody, but I know that there's something about praising the Lord in the dance which is scriptural and valid. As a matter of fact, when you're really dancing, and I used to be what you'd call a ballet fan. I, I knew the ballet inside out. When you were really dancing, Every part of your body is involved in that activity. And what was our body made for? To praise the Lord with. Every member of our body should be totally given over to praising the Lord. And that's liberation. When every member of your body is being used to praise God. Now don't imagine that I'm requiring that everybody immediately do this, but I'm just pointing out it's valid. Now then, the question remains, who should praise the Lord? Psalm 150 verse 6 says it very simply. Let everything that hath breath praise the Lord. So if you have breath, you're included. And if you want to turn to Psalm 148, verses 2 through 12, you'll get a list of specific kinds of persons and things that should praise the Lord. I won't go into it now. Time is running out. But if you'll check that list for yourself personally in Psalm 148, you'll find there are seven things in heaven and 23 things on earth that are specifically called to praise the Lord. And I doubt whether you can read through that list and make yourself the exception. All right, there's one last question. Is there anybody who should not praise the Lord? And the answer is just one class of persons, and it's the only one in the Bible, Psalm 115, verse 17, the dead praise not the Lord. That's the diagnosis of a lot of religious people's problems. Why don't they praise the Lord? Because they're dead. But as for me and my house, we're going to praise the Lord yet more and more.